So uh, tonight we have the honor to have with us Rabbi Pesach Kron, the world-renowned Moal author, lecturer, and uh, Baruch Hashem, we have a very close connection with the Rav in Chazak. He's been by us many times at our big events, and he's written the various different articles we've used for our Chazak magazine. And uh, this is our first interview for Chazak Radio and Chazak TV. So this is Mamish, a big covet, a big honor for us. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kron, for coming. It's a to be here. You know, I love the organization. You do great work. Thank you. And thank uh, you. it's amazing what you and your brother do. Your parents were blessed with wonderful children. I'm sure they're special, and it's a cover to know you. Baruch Hashem. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kron, for those kind words. I guess uh, let's start off straight with the interview. Uh, everyone, you know, is wondering. You do so many different things. Um, you're a lecturer, like I mentioned. You're a moal. You're an author. But I, I think there's something interesting that the crowd, would, the, the listeners, would want to know what came first. Well, what came first was... Uh, Hashem benched me with wonderful, wonderful parents. Yeah. Uh, just yesterday, just a few blocks from here, I spoke at a women's writers conference. Oh, yes. Mrs. Uh, Graber. Su Susie Garber. 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 Yes. Susie Garber. Yes. Right. She's terrific. Right. Now, when she asked me to speak for this, I thought, how many women are going to come? How many women are writers? But there must have been 60 there. Wow. It was amazing. And uh, my daughter, who's written Chaviva Kron right. Pfeiffer, she's written children's books. She just wrote a book called Making Hashem Proud. So she spoke also. And uh, I spoke, and I told everybody that Hashem blessed me with wonderful, wonderful parents. Just like you have wonderful parents, Baruch Hashem, I was blessed. And I got my writing from my mother. My mother loved writing. She loved music. She loved writing. What and was I, your mother's maiden name, Ackerman. She Ackerman. was from Philadelphia. She was born in Philadelphia, and she actually wrote a book called The Way It Was. And uh, I, that's how I got my writing. When I was in elementary school, she would help me write my composition. She would write your composition. Yeah, she would write it. Yeah, she wrote it. I got an A. It was great. And I said, hey, wait a second. We, you know, we could do this for a long time together. And, uh, and she would write, you know, for me and I would write and I learned how to write from her. And we did many, many different studies and thank you very, very much. We did many studies of, of writing. Uh, we would read, um, if I could say it at that time, we read the New York Times and we'd underline expressions. And she would ask me, how would you write this? And then you would see how they wrote it very concisely. And she was a master of expression. She was very poetic into flowers and music and things like that. And my father was a very great man. He was a very big time chacham, a very um, wonderful perfectionist. His handwriting was immaculate. As a matter of fact, when he went to Ney Israel and he wrote the Shurim of Rav Rudiman, he wrote the Rav, he wrote the Rav Shurim, and when they used the notes to write Rav Rudim Shurim, they used his notes. Oh, wow. They could have just printed it right from the way it was. Uh, you know my son-in-law, Hanani Kramer, when uh, Hanani got engaged, he was from Israel. So we printed something we called Oz Yuranenu, Avram Zelik, that was my father's name, Oz oh, Yuranenu. Wow. And we cute. gave out some shirim that the guys in the yeshiva didn't have from Rav Rudim, mm -hmm. because my father had the notes. Later on, they printed you know, into a safer. So it's like a family thing, the writing. Yeah, yeah the writing, the right. And then my father taught me Mila, and he always said to me, you should learn how to become a mile. I don't know if you'll be a mile, but learn it. And then you can make a choice whether you want it or not. And it was a very smart thing because, unfortunately, he got sick. And when I was only 21, he passed away. Oh. And I was learning guitar with us. I had to leave the yeshiva. And I was supporting my mother and my brothers and sisters. Oh, wow. the but the oldest I'm the oldest of seven. I wasn't married at the time. And um, 21? every 21, could you believe? And I always tell people that when I would come into a house, People would take a look at me, the, the mother or the grandmother would say, Ma, you look so young. I said, well, the baby's also young. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, so the meal came first, that was yeah. for sure. Well, actually, the writing, but not the writing professionally, although I did write in the Jewish Observer, one or two articles, and I wrote in Darkeno, Alameda, but that was small stuff. Yeah. But then, um, once I was doing bris Mila, and then eventually, I'll tell you the truth, it was... It was hard to find the shidduch, you know? Oh, like, really? Yeah, very hard, you know? For a guy like you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's hard to believe. I know. <laughs> you know why? Because nobody wanted their daughter to marry a guy that was supporting a woman and seven oh. kids. You know, like, oh, you know, like, I remember I went to Denver, Colorado, where my wife is from, and the first time I met my father-in-law, so um, he was a big time of it's all a story, interesting story, but what, what happened was he asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a moil. He said, yeah, but how do you make parnosa? 
I said, I'm a mile. <laughs> you know, like, you know, then with this one person a month. Uh, you know, like, you couldn't imagine this person every day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like... Today, and, just today you had two, right? Well, yeah. yesterday I had two, and then, uh, right, and now I have to go visit the babies. Actually, I had a third one. Yesterday was a fascinating one. There was a family in, uh, I, I don't want to say what area of Queens, but they have a nephew that uh, never... His father's a Goyish uh, fellow, and you know they separated. The family separated, and um, now they have this child themselves together with the mother of the baby, who's now becoming from. So I had to do a toughest bris on a five-year-old boy. Oh wow! Oh, that's that's tough, that's right? How do you do that? But could you imagine? I a few miles didn't want to do it. They're afraid. How are you going to tell a five-year-old kid you got to do a toughest bris? You know, touch him in that area. I said, leave it to me. And so what I did was I sent him a gift a couple days in advance. Uh, and I sent him my daughter's book, and his mother read him the book. And then when I came in, oh, this is the rabbi who sent you the gift. And I put him on my lap, and we were talking, and I, you know, you know, we had a very nice conversation, built a connection. Said, build a connection. And, um, you know, I told him that you have to go to camp. You're going to camp in the summer, right? So I'm a rabbi. I just have to check you, make sure that you're perfectly okay. And then when I did it, Right afterwards, he said, well, there was nothing, and he gave me a big hug. <laughs> you know, like, I couldn't, well, I was so, I gotta, I gotta show you a picture. Yeah. yeah, I was so happy, and the family was so happy. They were so nervous, how are you going to do it to right, a five-year-old right, kid? Right. right, and then I had two other persons besides that, one in Rabbi Taita Shul here in right. Queens, and the other in Young Israel of West Hempstead. Mm -hmm. So, and then besides that speech, and then I spoke at night for me, near Amanov. Oh, you know, the yeshiva, oh, like, yes. What a dinner. Nice oh, my gosh. First time I was a graduate. Oh, it was a like graduating no. dinner, and it was in Charitone. How it was gorgeous. do you do it all? It's, it's. <laughs> I, I'm saying I, I, I'm a regular guy, and I'm busy. With, and you're a rabbi, and you're, you're doing. Uh, what's? Is there like a secret recipe that you can share with us? <laughs> I, I don't know. I def, there's definitely siyat in the There's yeah, no definitely. question. And I have a great wife, Baruch Hashem, and you know she's Rabbit terrific. And she, yeah, and yeah, she she does it. Well, it was your wife's teacher, right? She was my wife's right? teacher, right? Shabbat right. High School, that's right. And uh, she does everything in the house. You know, she takes care of the finances. People ask me, you know, how much you pay for insurance? <laughs> <laughs> and you know anything? I'm know. proud to say, same here. I have yeah, no clue. Yeah, my yeah, wife, okay, she, yeah, she, you know, she does everything. But you know, raising the kids, you know, we did that together, obviously, with mm -hmm. Hashem. And um, and you know, and different children have taken over different things. You know, my son Eliezer, Eliezer has who's a mile, and he's spoken Hazak, and, and he's a speaker, speaker as well. And my son Avram is a great speaker. He's a Rebbe in Waterbury. Uh -huh, amazing. And, uh, so just Hashem, to see Hashem. the next generation take over. It's just so it's definitely a siyata de Shemaya, and uh, I don't get too much sleep at night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. beautiful. So there was the writing that came first. So the, well, the writing technically in high school, but for a profession, it was definitely the uh, the Mila. And then, and the then how did the lectures? And then the lectures. Come? What happened was that once um, Rav Shontradon came to America, oh, so I was in 1965, ask you, right? With the so Rav? what happened was that um, my father uh, was, you know, big time chacham, and he was very into the Duvna Magid. He always used to tell us Mashallah of the Duvna Magid. And so we used to uh, like to hear, you know, stories from Magidim or whatever. And then my father heard that there was a uh, Magid in Yerushalayim. And his name was Rabbi Shalom Shadron. Now, in 1964, I went to Israel for the first time. It was before the Six-Day War. So we didn't have the whole Yerushalayim. And uh, our goodness Yerushalayim had a very big Knesiyah. And they had many gathering, tzaddikim, a, a gathering, gathering from all over the world. All the great rabbis were there. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was oh, there, wow. and Rabbi uh, and, and Rabbi Elia Lapian was there from Eretz Yisrael, and Rabbi Zalman Sarotskin, and Rabbi Chaim Kreisworth from Antwerp. All the great rabbis. It was unbelievable. The you were rabbi. at this trip? I was there. I was, I was 17, 18 years old. And I, wow. you know, I, I went there with a tape recorder. All the great rabbis. Yeah, all, all the great rabbis, right? English. And they were all speaking, and I would tape it, you know, with a boombox type of tape recorder. It wasn't even a cassette. <laughs> You know, like oh the real the real, right? You're that old? Yeah, that's right. It was unbelievable. And uh, and then my father said, I'm going to have you stay in Eretz Yisrael so you could get to meet them for weeks afterwards. I was there for eight weeks on my own. And there were no cell phones, and people in Eretz Yisrael, not even everybody had telephones. I called my parents once a week. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, if a person had a telephone, well, you had to make an appointment when you're going to be able to use the phone, and then the, you would know to, you know, with the hours. We're really the spoiled nowadays. Oh, so, <laughs> that you're not kidding. So uh, what happened was that Rav Shalom Shadron was there, and um, I, I didn't meet him there, I just happened to see him, but I had a, a cousin, Chaim David Ackerman, who learned the Chavon Yeshiva. Ackerman, that's, that's oh, my your mother's mother. Right, so that was my, my first cousin. And he would tell us, he would send us cassettes of uh, Rav Shalom Shadron, and he would tell us, he would send it, my father loved them, and 
my father said, if Rabbi Shvatron ever comes to America, he's got to stay by us. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, like it was almost you know, like, well, yeah, I'm sure somebody's going to bring him in yeah, for a reason or something. They'll have a place for him to stay. But it turned out we found out that he was coming for Chinuch Hatzmoy. And at that time, they were hoping to build uh, high schools in Eretz Yisrael. It just didn't work out at that time for whatever reason, but that was the original goal. So Rabbi Shadron was coming, and I had a friend who was in Israel who was also working for Chenech Atzmai. So they were, arranging uh, the trip. they were arranging the trip, and they had him in an apartment in Borough Park set up. But my father said, no, he's got to stay by us. But I said, no, but it, he, he's got the apartment. Rabbi Menachem Parish, who was the head of the Agud at the time, they had him set up, but then there was a rainstorm, and there was a delay. He couldn't come in for two or three days. And so by the time he came in, we went to the airport. That apartment was taken already. Oh, so wow. my so so, so we were at the airport. My father went. My grandfather, my brothers, and myself. And Rabbi Shvardon looks at us. Who are these people? So this guy Rafi Brenner, who was by us for that Shabbos before, he said, "No, I know these people." So he said, "Could you eat by them?" He said, "Yeah, I was just there for Shabbos." So they said, "Okay, good. He'll stay overnight." Wow. And I'll never forget if I live to be 180. We were driving home on the Van Expressway. Rabbi Shvardon was 53 at the time. And um, he, my father said to him, I just want you to know, Rabbi Shadron, you don't know us, but I'm just telling you, our house is yours. Whatever Chumrah you have, whatever you want, we'll do. that will do for you. And he came in, and my father had added an addition to the house, a base medish, his own base medish, never had a minion there, just a lot of swarm. Rabbi Shadron walked in, house in America. He thought that America was cool, a secular, <laughs> and he sees a house, on like a base swarm. medish, and a house swarm, he couldn't believe it. And he was, and my father put on the tape recorder the second he walked into the house, and we were recording everything. And Rabbi Shadron was so touched that he decided to stay. And one of the greatest stories ever, I'm sure that your audience doesn't know this, this is in the beginning of the Margaret Speaks in the uh, introduction. I tell that after a couple of days, Rabbi Shadron said, Okay, I'll stay here, but I have to pay. Oh. So my father said, Come on, you know, <laughs> you, you know, well, well, no, we so have to pay that. you to stay. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> He said, listen, I'm telling you, I know that I'm going to be here for a while, so it has to be that you pay, that I pay. So my father said, okay, let me figure out how much it should be. Now, Rabbi Shardun told me this story years later. My father never told me the whole story. And um, he gave Rabbi Shardun a very high price. Now, Rabbi Shardun told me that my, my father gave him I couldn't believe it. Like, it was shocking, right? Like, it, 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 like I, I, you know, I want to pay. But, you know, I liked the man. They became like brothers. Your but, father was so persistent to bring him in. Yeah, and, and, now he, and now he's, wow. So he paid him, you know, and he stayed six months. Now, he wasn't only six months in our house. He went to Cleveland, he went to Chicago, went to different places, but whatever. When he was there, my parents treated him like anything. And then he decided he's going back to Eretz Yisrael right after Pesach, right before she was. He stayed already for Pesach. He was in America. And... My, he didn't want to go back by plane. He said the transition from America to Eretz Yisrael is too great. I can't do it in one day. I've got to thaw out by plane, by boat. So he went to the port in, in Manhattan. I think he was going to go with the Zim Lines. I think that was the one. This talk Whatever. is uh, beyond my time. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Right. Oh, imagine going both Eretz Yisrael yeah. four, five, six weeks or whatever, five weeks. Anyhow, so my father goes, I remember we went with him to go by plane. And by then, boat? By boat, rather. We go to the port, and then my father asks us all to step back. And my father takes Rabbi Shadron into the boat, and he gives him an envelope. Rabbi Shadron says, what is this? He says, this is the money that you paid. <laughs> so Rabbi Shadron said, what are you talking about? He says, you didn't think I was going to take any money from you, right? This because the exact bills you gave me. I didn't not even put them into my pocket. So. I'm going to stop crying in a second. Yeah. So Rabbi Shadron said, Rabbi Avro, i got to ask you this. Do you know what I thought of you when you gave me such a high price? Why did you give me such a high price if you knew you weren't going to take any money? He said, Rabbi Shadron, I wanted you to use the house freely. If you were paying a high price, you would do anything you want. And that's why, wow. that's why I gave you the high price. Wow. He gives back every penny. That's a story. Could that you imagine? Unbelievable. Now listen to this. To make the rub feel comfortable in the right. house. He... Right. And now listen to this. I'm never, my father was not an outwardly emotional person like I am, right? Right, right? So I was sitting down, you know, and I see my father, and he's like, he's so, he misses him so bad. He's writing him a letter that afternoon, and he was going to send it to Boston because the, the boat was going to stop in Boston or something. And so they would be able to get a letter there. 
and Shabbos was sitting at the table, and my father says, I want to go to Eretz Yisrael to see Rav Shalom. I'm going to meet him when he gets off the boat. I said, what are you talking about? How are you going to get there? You don't even have a passport. He said, I'm going to fly, and I'm going to get there beforehand. So, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll shut this. That's okay. No, 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 I'll shut this. I'm sorry. It's not a problem. Anyway, so, um, so what happened? Uh, so, my father gets a passport. He can do anything. I think, I don't know how he got it, he could, arrange, he could arrange anything. You know, there's certain people that are capable, you know, like, <laughs> they, do you, know, you can do anything that you got to do. So, uh, sure enough, Rabbi Shadron, Chaim David Ackerman, my cousin, picks up my father from the airport, and they go to meet Rabbi Shadron. Now, you know who Rabbi Shadron was? She was Rabbi Shlomo's almost Orbach's sister. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Leah Orbach, that was her name. Shlomo's oh, Shlomo's Shlomo's so they were brothers-in-law, yeah, right. So now what happened was that uh, she goes to, uh, and she meets Rav Shalom Shadron. She meets my father, uh, and then they travel together from Yerushalayim to go up to Haifa, right? right? Because that's where the boat ah, was, right? The that's boat, where the boat comes in, right? The rubber's coming. Now, this is the most incredible thing. So, my father was a very sensitive person. He didn't want that the first person that Rav Shalom was about to see, see him. Let him see his wife and family and his kids. Fine. So his wife and family go up and they greet their husband, their father. And then, Rabbi Tzachadron says to uh, her husband, your best friend came to see you. <laughs> so, Rabbi Tzachadron says, it's impossible. So what do you mean? She says, he said, I left my best friend in America. Oh. And then my father walked out. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And they hugged and they kissed and they spent the other together. Wow. And then when my father came back, that's when he got sick. Oh my gosh, it was awful. He had had the greatest time of his life, and then he came back, unfortunately. It was a whole mess with the x-rays, the doctor misread the x-rays. And within a year, almost a year, year and a half, my father was Nifta Shmini and Saras. That's such a sad, yeah. such, such a sad ending. ending right. was, was the Rebbe's father a rub? No, he was a mile. He was a big time of but he didn't have a shul or anything like that. And uh, But he was a mile. And, mm -hmm. uh, Unbelievable. There's so much to talk about, uh, but unfortunately we are a little bit time limited. So I guess uh, we'll go on to the topic of the books, the Maggots. Okay, so now, so what happened was like this. The last cover I saw had all these all pictures. This, right, and right, 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 right. I don't have it here with me, but okay. But the idea is that um, I, you know, I, 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 when I said yesterday at the writers' conference, I said when Hanoch Teller started writing stories, you know, I had gotten to know him a little bit. I was very impressed with his writing. And I saw that he was writing stories and people were interested in stories. Right. So I said to Rabbi Shadron, you know, nobody has ever written your stories. Oh, he's when the Rav was yeah, alive. Sure, he was still alive. And um, so he said, okay, so let's write them. You know, so I said, I have to write them in English. Right. So he wanted that I should translate in Yiddish or in Hebrew. So what I did was I sent it to my cousin, Chaim David Eichmann. He was still in Eretz Yisrael. And he would translate to Rabbi Shadron. And Rabbi Shardron sometimes would say, hey, wait a second, you learned a different lesson from that story than I did. <laughs> and, uh, and so then what we did was, in the Magid books, is that the typeface before the story and after the story is different. The story itself was Rabbi Shardron's story. Right. And the book is called The Magid Speaks, because the, the, he was the Magid of Yishalayim. Yeah, Shardron was the Magid. But the right. introduction and the ending was mine. Oh. So it was a different typeface. And that worked so well that when, after the first book, what happened was, one day I came to the art school office, they were still on Coney Island Avenue, they weren't as big as they were today, and um, I come to and I speak to Rav Nassim Sherman, and Rav Nassim Sherman says, you've got to write another book. I said, what do you mean write another book? What am I supposed to write? He says, well, yeah, I want you to know, I was just in South Africa, in Johannesburg, and I came into a class, and a Rebbe had your book, The Market Speaks, <laughs> on the desk. He was teaching kids, and teach, people are teaching your stories, you've got to write more. So I went back to Rabbi Shadron, but I had taken his best stories already, so I could only get about 30 more. But I have about 100 in every book between 90 and 100. So I started asking people. And once I started writing stories, people thought, hey, maybe if this guy can write a story, maybe he could tell a story. <laughs> and that's how the speaking started. Oh, look that's that. how the speaking started. It was because of that. So now, but I, I used to speak in camp. I used to speak at the Sheva Brachas. But the real speaking came because of the Magid books. Wow. And, and then wherever I went, people would tell me stories. I'd go to England, Switzerland, or whatever, wherever I was invited. And wherever I go, people tell me yeah, stories. And what, where are we up to in the, in the Magid Speaks? So now, Baruch Hashem, so we have eight, store, eight, eight books. books, right? Two that nine started nine. with the Magid Speaks, around the Magid's table, and the footsteps of the Magid, along the Magid's journey, always with the word Magid in it. 
and referring to Rav Shalom. Rav Shalom. Well, now the Rav is the, <laughs> the Rav is Baruch Hashem. Well, that's why I always said in the footsteps of the Magid, he's the original <laughs> Magid, right? right, right, right. right. In the splendor of the Magid, you're right. I never want to take the title for myself, <laughs> but. Um, then I wrote a book on Brismila. That was the first book that I wrote. The first book was, was on Brismila. Uh-huh. And then I wrote a book on the traveling to Europe, to Lithuania. Oh, I went to get Traveling to with the Magid. Yes, yeah, that's yes. good. That so was, the rub, right. uh, how did that all start? Oh, so what Poland happened? Poland right, Europe. right, right, right. Toronto. As a matter of fact, I'm going to Poland in, uh, you know, July 8th. Anybody wants to come? July 8th, okay. How do we get more information about that? Uh, just call Project Masora. Ari Shafford, Project Masora. Oh, that's not the rub. Project Masora. Uh, dar- 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 no, no, I, I, I only do the speaking. I, have not, <laughs> I don't have not anything to do with the uh, food, go, you know. <laughs> Hotels, forget about it. We I also had, a, to... I remember we had a trip with the Rav, uh, the oh, Quorum right, around the quorum, here. That yes. was great. Yeah, that, that was, was actually the day of my wedding. That was the day of really? my wedding. Really? Yes. Wow. December 2nd. Right, but a... you weren't there, I just want to say. Yes, yeah. I was there. <laughs> we yeah. had a Chazak But I want you to know all over the world. That video, people have called yes, me for yes, that video. Yes, yes, right, yes, that's an amazing thing. thing that, so, ha, ha, how so, did it all happen? Oh, so that what happened. So now, once I started writing about many, many different Gedolim, there was a guy, Eli Slam, was from ENS Tours. He called me up and he said, "Listen, you know, we want to go to Lithuania, and we're going to go to Vilna and Raden, where the Chavetz Chaim is buried, and Kovna and Slabotka and Branovich, Grodna." I said, oh, good, I'd like to go. Who's, who's going to do the leading of the speech? Uh, you know, I'd like to hear everybody's yeah. mind on this. He said, no, we want you to do it. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> what, 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 what am I doing in Lithuania? Villa, wasn't that 800 years ago? Like, like what wow. are you talking about? Amazing. So I told him at that time. So this said, guy has a big schuss. What's his name again? Eli Slamowitz. Yeah, yeah, from <laughs> ENS Tours. He was great. So he had gone as C program to Russia and Poland, so mainly Russia, so he knew a little bit the language. And... Um, I said, listen, I need a year to prepare. Because I was finishing a Magid book. I said, I can't do two of those things at one time. How long does it take to put so, a so, book together? Oh, the two book, books. every book is about two years. Oh, wow. About two years. But uh, the trip, so for the first one, it also took about a year of preparation. Because what I wanted to do was, who are your Oimer, who are your Oisa? He's the, he said, he, and he was. What he was and what he said. Tzaddik. Which tzaddik. So in other words, if let's say we went to the Vilna Garden, the first year that we went, we had two buses, it was about 120 people. The first year. The wow. first year, 2003. And when we stood outside Rab Chaim Moise's house, so I told about Rab Chaim Moise, about what he did in Vilna, and then I told about his life history. Then I said, Dear Reiter, and I had my son Avram Zelik, who's a Rebbe in Waterbury today, he came with me. And he would say a Shailon Shuva, let's say, from the Achieza, from, from what our prime did. Oh, and wow. then when we went through Rabbi, um, um, Elchan, Rabbi um, Elchan and uh, Spectre, right, we went to, not, I'm forgetting his name in a second, but uh, when we went to uh, the Kovnerov, right. so he over there, he said also about the Kovnerov, Rav Spectre, and uh, he said Shailon Shuva is about him. Yeah, and then by the Dvar Avram, every place he had a Dvar Torah. We have each the, there are place. DVDs. Oh yeah, all this is all right. I think one day we're just going to put it on a website. All local Judaica stores. I mean, all local Judaica stores. I, I've seen it. I'm yeah, saying, yeah, have, yeah, have yeah those, definitely. Uh, right, right. It was called Catching Sacred Letters. Okay, Rabbi Yitzchok Chanan inspected. That's the name. Rabbi Yitzchok Chanan, and then my son would say a fascinating tshuva. You know, we would go over this in advance. So I did the history and the inspiration, and he did the halachas. Not Rabbi Yitzchok. This is Rabbi Avram. Avram, and then on another trip, Rabbi Yitzchok came with me. Oh, you got to hear him. You got to get him a chazak. He's fabulous. Big time chacham. Very good. I, we are, you know, time flies when you're yeah. having fun. There's no question about it. There's uh, so much going on, Baruch Hashem. So much to talk about. Um, I guess uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the Ruff from an ex- exclusive news story, not published yet, or maybe not said yet. Does the Ruff have anything that sticks out? I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, I'm no, sorry no, about no. that. When is this coming out? When is this coming out? This is going to be coming out within the week, Amir Tesh. Oh, within the week. Hopefully. So I'll tell you, um, uh, there are some great stories, but I don't know if it's proper for me to tell this particular story, which I won't do because <laughs> I'm using it. I've used it already. I made the Chavetz Chaim video. Oh, Fish Yeah, Yeah, I'm on So we're going to show it in the video. Yeah, so we're going to show that. So that's 50,000 people. You mentioned Chavetz Chaim. Yeah. You had a big part with the first year. Yeah, I was the first speaker. I remember you mentioned Yeah, I was the Baruch Hashem. So I was the first speaker that they had. Rav Segel had told Michael Rothschild to start this organization. And uh, many years ago, um, he called me, and we were in Flatbush. We had a big gathering. And then one time, you wouldn't believe it, 
one time he calls me up, he said, how would you like to speak for, you know, like 20,000 people? I said, Michael, what are you crazy? Madison you Square Garden. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you going to write down? Madison Square Garden. He said, no, 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 listen to me. We're going to go to Beis Yaakov of Brooklyn, Rabbi Teichman School. And we're going to have two cameras. And we're going to video you. And then there's going to be a Yom Iyun, let's say like a January 1st, when yeah. people are off from work. And we're going to send it to all the Jewish community centers, all the shuls around the country. And in the summer, we're going to send it to camps. And that's how the Chavetz Chaim Heritage Foundation started. The vision yeah. that you could reach. Today, do you know that this video, Bezat Hashem, 50 to 60,000 people will see it. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Amir really Tashem will yeah. be in Eretz Yisrael, but yes. for whatever reason, Chavetz Chaim Heritage yeah. Foundation, they do it every year. Yeah, Their fabulous. videos. So, Rabbi, does Rebbe know the other speakers this year? Yes, yes. Yeah, Rabbi Lef, Zev Lef is oh, the other speaker. And there's two more. One is Rabbi Rieti, Jonathan oh, Rieti, yeah. yeah. So and the other part. one is a Rabbi Reich, who's a Rebbe in Or Samea. Oh, Mansi, yes, Mansi. yes. Right. I've heard of him. Right. Right. Oh, right. beautiful. Right. Right. Oh, so we were discussing a, a story. Does Rebbe have yes. anything that we uh, can use? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, <laughs> and so much probably running through the line. Thousands I'm just trying to, to think, have... you know, this. <laughs> well, there's a beautiful story that I've told. Um, Many times since it happened, it's not in a book yet, although I did write it in Hamodia on one of their uh, publications. publications uh, a beautiful story, and I just told it actually. Um, but when did I tell it? I just told it. Re oh, this morning. Oh, there's a new project coming out. Oh, my. <laughs> You were speaking this morning? Yeah. I spoke twice already today. Already? I spoke this morning for in living lessons, which I'll show you What's something. Oh, this is unbelievable. Okay. And uh, I just spoke by Rabbi Sarruti Asaf's seminary. It's the last day of the seminary, and somebody got sick and they needed a speaker, so she called me last night. <laughs> so I just spoke for an hour there. I was just uh, amazing. That's amazing. So, but this morning, there's a new project coming out. Living living lessons. Listen to this. You know Hanani Kramer, my son-in-law. He's very capable, yeah. right? Kora Multimedia. So what we did is like this. What he designed, uh, an idea. What we want to do is for all schools and for all from kids, and this is going to be from third to eighth grade. This is As like another new, new vision, guys. New vision. This is the, before, the, the first ones to hear Before Chavetz Chaim. That's know, right. This is, this this is, is it. Okay, it's called see. Living Lessons, living and lessons. what I did was I recorded in a studio in Manhattan this morning about seven or eight stories, some that I heard from Shalom Shadron, about Rosh Hashanah, about Tshuva, about Aser Simei Tshuva. And he's going to animate it. Oh, so wow. my voice is going to be the background and to be animation of these stories. I can tell you one of those stories. Oh, listen to this story. It's fabulous. <laughs> and you can imagine the animation with the music in the background. And this is going to be for all schools. They're going to be able to tap in any registered machana who's registered with, I think, with Tarmasara or something. Or I don't know exactly Contact which Contact us. We will find yes, information. We'll find, right? all the and all the there. issues we're able to get it, they'll show it in L to all the schools. Boys schools, girls schools, all over the country. And this is just for L or this is a major no, be something yeah, that that's we hope. We oh, hope what? that we're going to get sponsorships, you know, so for the rest an of them. Animated stories. Now listen to this. The Rome's voice? Yeah, yeah. I just told the okay. stories. I just told the story. I told the story with Romul. Can't Romul, but I'll tell you another story okay, that I told. Okay. Two stories. So this is so beautiful. I told the story that there was once a little boy that was playing by a beachfront. Okay? So you see a little boy. Obviously, they're going to animate it, right? Yeah, okay, I want to watch yeah. it. <laughs> it's, it's great. And a man comes over to him and he says to him, Little boy, why are you playing here on this side of the beach? All the children are on the other oh, side of the beach. He said, no, because there's a boat that's going to come by, and I want to see the boat. He said, little boy, there's no boats that come by on this side of the beach. Only an ocean liner is going to go by on this side. The boats are on the other side. He said, no, 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 that's the ocean liner that I want to see. He said, why do you want to see the ocean liner? He says, because, you see this flag, I'm going to wave the flag to the captain of the ocean liner and he's going to wave his flag back. He said, little boy, don't be silly. The ocean liner, the captain of that ocean liner is a very important person. He's not even going to know that you're here. He's not going to look for you. And, and you're going to wave, and you think he's going to wave back. He says, no, I know for sure. He's going to be waiting for me to wave the flag. He said, how do you know that? You're a little kid. What makes yeah. you? Yeah, he said, because the captain is my father. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, and that's, that's Hashem. Oh. Hashem is the captain of the world, the navigator of the universe, and, and he's, he's waiting for us to wave our flag. How do we wave our flag? 
with Torah. If I only had a crowd of here, I would yeah. just ask them to give a round of applause for that story. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? Amazing. I can just imagine yeah. that animation. Yeah, the animation, you know, the waves and the Listen. seagulls, you know, Hanani and I were talking about it afterwards. Be, uh, it's beautiful. How come no one ever thought of this? I don't know. It's, it's a great idea. Is, uh, it's fabulous. Yeah, well, hopefully with the for Hanukkah, for Pesach, you know? Beautiful. It's a beautiful idea. I, I told the Rub an idea once, something on the Parsha. Yeah, guy. I think and we the Rub, no, I'm saying the Rub should give a, the Magid on the Parsha. One day we'll see the book. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's one story. So, okay. okay. Now here's another story that I told over there. It was so beautiful, and um, I said it happened in camp. It was a true story. It happened in Camp Romo this past summer in Monticello. Now another son-in-law of mine. I don't know if you know him. He's now the Manali Yeshiva Katana of um, Long Island, Shlomo David Pfeiffer. 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 Shlomo David Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Yeah. So he was that's a Rebbe Yeshiva Katana for many years, and now he's the Manal in, um, uh, in in Yeshiva Katana of Long Island. Very, very capable guy. Very capable. He's the husband of my daughter, who's the writer. Right, the one Khabib, the book that we right, start right, off. We start off, right. right. So, he was the camp learning director, him and a guy, Avrami Dell. Camp so, Roma. Oh, camp Roma, last year, in 2013. So now, camp, I don't know if you've ever been to a summer camp, but boys, right. it's very hard and on Shabbos because the kids can't play baseball, they're not swimming, so what do you do? So how are you going to get them, exactly. you know, proactive and everything excited? So what they decided was that they were going to have a learning program, and every boy who learns a half hour gets a, a ticket, and they'll be put into raffle, they get a prize. Fine. Just, so if a boy learns one hour, he gets two tickets, and if he learns two hours, he gets four tickets. And the head council announced that the prize is going to be one or two prizes, either. Sorry, that, uh, no you, problem. You, I guess it, it went okay. off. That's okay. Okay, I'm sorry about the that. The golf cart of the head council, you could drive it for an hour, mm -hmm. you know, because everybody likes the golf cart of the head council. Or you could go horseback riding. Now, this past nice summer, right? <laughs> this, there was, this, right? This past summer, there were seven boys from Antwerp, and one of the boys from Antwerp said, Oh, I want to win that prize of horseback riding. And everybody was laughing at me. There's 400 kids in a camp, you know, how's he going to win? But anyway. <laughs> Anyhow, wouldn't you know it that they, they have all the tickets and everybody and then Mozart Shabbos and they pick out a raffle and this kid wins. Wow. They, they, like nobody they could believe it. it. How could they Antwerp, how could that kid from <laughs> Antwerp win? You know, just because he wanted to win? And at the banquet a few weeks later, the head counselor announced, or the owner of the camp, Robert Shlomo Pfeiffer, he said... Oh, Pfeiffer related? Yeah, related is a cousin to my oh. son-in-law. And he said, I just want to tell you how proud I am that all you guys were learning and you spent so much time learning, but I want to tell you about a secret that I just found out. We all wondered, how did that kid win? We all knew he wanted to win. Right. So what happened was that all the boys in his bunk, they learned many, many hours over Shabbos. And once at Shabbos, when they got tickets, they put his name on the ticket. Wow! Could you imagine? Wow! So when the time... The, me, I'm Yisrael. I say to me, I said, as I said this morning on Living Lessons, that the biggest miracle is the kids didn't tell them. They kept the secret. Could the you kids, imagine? The kids, 10-year-old kids kept the secret. But that's me, I'm So That's Amos Yisrael. I, again, I wish there was a crowd <laughs> round of applause for that story. Wow, these kids are unbelievable. That's right. I, I wish uh, we got to contact them, find them, and <laughs> interview them for such an amazing thing that they did. That's right. It's like the famous story also that you have with Chaya. And the, and yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, wow, that's, that's great. That's, yeah, everyone yeah. knows that yeah, story. That's I don't true. Think, yeah, but, that's uh, true. Okay, Rabbi Krohn, it was a pleasure. It was a privilege. Uh, oh, my I gosh, know, look at that. I know, I, know, I know that time flies. Uh, we will definitely... Rabbi, I know, I know, I know you got to do me this other yeah, thing. Yeah, go ahead. we got to have another one of them. Yeah, for sure. We, we barely touched it. <laughs> okay, we got five more minutes. We got I'm, five. I'm okay, yeah, beautiful. Okay, okay, the baby. Okay, okay. Okay. I'm fine. So, yeah. you know, let's get into the topic of Chazak. Okay. The big Chazak event, Rabbi, was there, and we discussed a team for 18. And we, do, Rebbe actually came up with that with that line. We we're going to have a sponsor a team campaign, and uh, we, we, everything that we do with Chazak is about Kira, It's about bringing people back. Obviously, we have the Chizuk aspect of things. If the Rav could just touch upon what we spoke about at the big event, which was being a car of others, bringing others that are less affiliated, bringing them back. If we could just touch upon that in the last few minutes. And uh, and and then if we could, uh, I'm kind of conflicting because I wanted to ask the Rav to leave one lesson for of our uh, for our audience. So I guess if, if you could, uh, you could some way, somehow, we did not discuss this before the program, unfortunately. So I'm saying if, if the Rav could... It's uh, not a problem. Not a problem. I think one of the most beautiful things you know, I've been living in Kew Garden, in Queens, I should say. I came here in 1952. Ooh, 
I'm seven years old. That's a long You're time. That young? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Baruch Hashem. My father came to Queens because there were many Mohalim in Brooklyn, so he uh, came to Queens because he nice. joined, you know, the Queens Hospitals. And also Rabbi Yaakov Tanabam was living in Kew Gardens, so that was, that became Rav our still Rav. In the show, right? uh, yeah, in that show, but now that's his son, who is Rabbi Shlomo Tanabam, who is now the Rav there. But I have seen how Queens has changed, and many, many of the Queens people have become Balachu, especially in the Bukharian community, yes. because of your organization, because of Hazak. And I, I have I just seen the yeshivas, how Ezra has done such a wonderful job, besides that first motion, or Yisrael and Yeshiva Khan, of course. But the idea is, look what Chazak has done. And to be able to bring children back to Hashem is it, it, just the, the greatest thing. And yes. I, I want to tell you a very beautiful story. A beautiful story. Uh, and, and, you've told yeah, me yeah, yeah, no, 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 so no, many. This is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> and uh, I just told this story. Um, I have to remember where I spoke recently. And, uh, You've been spoken everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, Ramchal Ber Weismandel was a very, very big tzaddik, a genius. He wrote a statement called Minam Meitzar. It's absolutely a photographic memory, tremendous. He was in Nitra in, our, in uh, Europe, and uh, never he lost a wife and five children. And he came to America. There's a book by Oscar called The Unheated Cry that tells about how he wanted to save Jews, and he wrote letters, and nobody believed him. And, and many Jews were lost, obviously. And uh, he came to America, and he went to Mount Kisco. He remarried, and he had five sons. And at the fifth son by the bris, this is what he said. Listen to this. It's unbelievable. He said, I had five children who died of Kiddush Hashem. And now I hope that these five children that I have will now be able to live of Kiddush Hashem. And he said, he said, now I understand that the... Um, what we say in Kedusha, that's the way the Ashkenaz say, the Kadesh as Shimchab Olam, let us sanctuary, like to sanctify the name of Hashem in this world, Keshem Shemadishim also Bishmeim Aron, just like those people who are today in heaven and they died on Kedush Hashem, we should be able to live on Kedush Hashem. And listen to what he said, the Satma Rebbe, when he heard this thing that I'm about to tell you, he cried, the Karo Zel Zevi Amar, each one, those in heaven and those here, will be able to say Kadosh, 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 each one on Kiddush They died on Kiddush Hashem, but well, we have to live on Kiddush Hashem. And Rav Palm said a fabulous word. In Tilm, there's a posseh, Rav Natsayach, Rav Nekorach, Yisudosai al Harare Kodesh. Yisudosai means the foundation is on the mountains of Kiddush So Rav Palm asked, what does it mean, the mountains? What mountains? What two mountains are we talking about? So he said there are two mountains that were critical in the history of Klai Yisrael. One was Haro Maria, that was where Yitzchak had the Akedah, right. and over there he taught Jews how to die on Kiddush Hashem. He was willing to die willing on to Kiddush give Hashem. give his life, yes. Hashem, and Har Sinai, where we were taught how to live on Kiddush Hashem. Those are the foundations, how to die on Kiddush Hashem and to live on Kiddush Hashem. And we have to be so grateful that our Nesayan in life is how to live on Kiddush Hashem. And what you guys are doing, and what I saw last night by Tefer's Torah dinner, so many of the Bukharians who got up, I don't remember their names, but how they became Bali Chuba 10 and 12 years ago, that's through you. And, and they, Baruch Hashem, many of them are wealthy, they gave tremendous amounts of money for the Staka. And it's all what you guys are teaching, how to live on Kiddush Hashem, <laughs> because you do it with Simcha, you do it with happiness and an upbeat, and that's that's what Hashem wants. Hashem, imagine I always tell Hashem people, one hundred percent. And I imagine I always say, if there are thirteen and a half million Jews in the world, four out of five are not religious. Imagine if you were walking on Main Street and you saw a guy that four out of five kids were at risk. Your heart would break for him. And that's how that's our heart nice. has to break for Hashem. For Hashem yes. And you guys are making Hashem happy. Join the revolution, ladies and gentlemen. Be a part of it any way you can, each individual in his own unique ways. Thank you very much, Rabbi Krohn. Thank you very pleasure. much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All the